really needed to empower patients to understand and manage their own health by connecting them to information, care, and support in meaningful and accessible ways. As this is a question and answer session, there is no prepared format. Questions can be submitted via chat or it may be a small enough group that you can feel free to raise your hands. Please identify the team you're on so that we can try and answer questions from as many teams as possible. There is a limited amount of time, so I'm going to try to distribute the questions among the teams as much as I can. We also request that you try and keep your question to a single topic. No 16 part, multi part A, B, C, and D questions that are almost impossible to answer. Um, and at the end, there is a survey we'd like you to fill out about how this particular portion of the event went. Kirsten, I was going to start with you, if that's OK. Kirsten Emmons is the Director of Clinical Innovation at Hill Rom in Indiana. Her primary role on the Global Innovation Team draws on her background in inpatient oncology care, outpatient infusion, and home hospice to make sure that patient and caregiver are at the center of projects throughout the organization. Um, Kirsten, part of Hillcom's mission is advancing connected care. Can you explain a little bit about how you use innovation to do that? Yeah, thank you guys for joining. So connected care, um, Hillrom has primarily played in the acute care space. Hold on one moment. I have a guest with me, Dylan. <laughs> I don't know what she's playing with. The, the glory of virtual meetings on a Saturday. Uh, so Hillrom has primarily been focused on the acute care environment where we have developed devices such as hospital beds, surgical tables, monitoring devices etc. And one of the things that um, we knew going forward in the past couple of years, we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to connect the data coming from those devices and turn it into something meaningful for the caregivers. And so with that becomes the innovation of not only the ways to connect those devices, but how can you connect those discrete pieces of data into something useful for the caregivers. And as we talk about chronic illnesses, we know that in acute case, an acute phase of those chronic illnesses end up in the hospital. We're now working through the strategies of what if you can keep those patients home and avoid the exorbitant costs that come with recurrent hospitalizations of chronic, Ill, chronically ill patients. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Miles Ellenby is a second panelist. He's the medical director of the telemedicine program and the Office of Digital Health at OHSU. He is also a professor of pediatrics at the School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Ellen B, your background is in critical care. Can you talk about how a chronic condition is also impacted, how that ties together? Um, absolutely. Um, so welcome everyone on this uh, chilly afternoon here in Portland. Um, so uh, I am an intensivist and our initial telemedicine uh, foray started on, a, on the acute care side, providing consultations to community hospitals but as we were growing that program, we knew that there were many more opportunities in, uh, in telehealth to improve care beyond just the ICU or uh, acute care settings. And I think the areas of greatest potential growth are the concept of remote patient monitoring, which is not, nothing new to anyone now. Um, and as uh, Kirsten just mentioned, the concept of developing the hospital at home uh, there's a lot of scenarios where patients can be cared for just as safely at home with appropriate level of monitoring. In fact, some would argue better um, than in the hospital environment. And so a lot of our efforts now are moving towards uh, with that in mind. Uh, I'll you. leave it at that in the interest of time. Okay. Uh, Omkar Kulkarni is the Chief Innovation Officer at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. His role is to bring together communities to transform pediatric care using human-centered design. Omkar, I know that uh, Children's Hospital is focused on care model innovation. Can you explain a little bit more about what that means and how it particularly impacts pediatrics? Sure. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me. So, you know, pediatric care, uh, which we define as kids between zero and 18, sometimes a little bit older, for a long time has been kind of uh, much of the same. For many years, it was basically you went in to see your doctor, you went into the hospital to see a specialist, uh, and you got your care, and then you went home. And I think there are now uh, a couple things about pediatric care, in including in Oregon and California and other places. They, they tend to be 
um, healthcare delivery systems where you have uh, a bit of a centralized, geographically centralized group of specialists who are really good at um, you know certain certain types of specialty care. Uh, but as you get further and further from city centers, you have less and less of those specialists available. And so as you think about uh, you know our world of technology, especially right now impacted by COVID, but even before and after, uh, there are new ways of taking care of patients that don't involve them having to miss a day of school, miss a day of work, have to drive all the way to the center of the city just to get access to the health care they need. The other part of this is, in a really good way, uh, kids are uh, thriving through many of their chronic conditions. Maybe 50 years ago they weren't, right? So now they're getting treated well, and and as a result, they're they're actually they have chronic conditions that you know they may have for 10, 15 years through their childhood. And so, you know, again, we want to be let, we want to make sure they get high quality of care and have less disruption so they can live their lives, go to school, go to play sports and all that kind of stuff. And so through remote monitoring, virtual care, telemedicine, mobile apps, different technology, we really can create new care models that uh, allow kids to be healthy, but have, you know, care at home. Um, Miles, you've raised your hand. Yes. Oh, you're muted. Now can you hear me? Now I can hear you, yes. A little too aggressive with the button. I just wanted to add to Am Amkar's uh, comments regarding pediatrics as a pediatrician. Um, historically, pediatrics has represented a very small piece of the market, and so a lot of attention has not been focused on kids. But one could easily argue that the investment early plays out long term to greater returns. Um, obviously that's a pediatrician speaking, but as far as market penetration, kids are still a relatively small market. And so there's been a, not a lot of attention. I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Shauna Doucette is the director for the Harris Health System Center for Innovation. In that role, she has created an innovation hub and has been instrumental in connecting with external partners to advance innovation in a method that evolved from a suggestion box to a $30 million in savings. How does innovation drive the Harris Health System? Hi, everyone. I'm excited to be here and talk about innovation with you all. Um, within uh, Harris Health System, which is the Houston, Texas uh, Safety Net Health System, We've looked at innovation quite differently. We look at how we can partner with community. We look at how we can partner with the uh, Texas Medical Center, which has a very um, vast and advanced uh, innovation hub in itself that allows us to have access to the latest technology um, and the latest uh, approaches to managing chronic disease, as well as um, interaction, interacting with patients to ensure that um, we promote programs and opportunities that are self-directed for patients. And that's where we really focus on our opportunities within Harris Health System to ensure that we're empowering our patients at different um, levels within the um, economic bridge to ensure that they have access to the same level of care that everyone else does. Thank you. Uh, many of you heard Christine Monkhouse speak last night. She's the CEO and founder of Patient Orator, a digital health startup that is using a mobile app to help underserved patients document their medical systems. Christine, can you speak a little bit more about how you help patients figure out the right systems, the right symptoms to record, how not to ignore things that could perhaps be critical in diagnosis and treatment? Sure. Um, so thank you all for having me and i um, thoroughly excited to be here. First, I'd like to start by saying that uh, as a patient, um, when we were thinking about creating this tool, um, one of the things that I went back to beyond my, my patient experience is working with underserved communities and understanding the issues that, that actually drive disease. Um, so those were issues pertaining to health literacy and, and um, communication breakdown, but more importantly, those social determinants of health issues um, that many people um, pre-COVID uh, did not acknowledge or were addressing. So our tool, um, which is in, in private beta, what it does is it allows patients to um, not only record their symptoms, um, 
and not specifically just any symptom that they want to, but if there's a health issue, for example, for me, someone who lives with chronic uh, pain, um, each time I have a pain incident, I record that pain issue um, within the app so that when I'm communicating with my medical professionals or even with, uh, with informal caregivers, um, that they can have the language that the medical professionals use um, and be uh, very, very, um, very to the point of what the problem is. So that's the way in which we built a tool. It's built around communication, but there's also other components that we're addressing in terms of um, chronic health conditions. Thank you. Miles, did you have something to add? No, okay. And last we have Mike Payne. Mike Payne is the Chief Commercial Officer at Zoom Care. He's got a 20 year career in healthcare and focuses on op opening new patient access channels and optimizing revenue. Mike, Zoom Care started as an urgent care center and how is it shifting to manage chronic conditions and using innovation to support that shift? Oh, you're muted. That's good. That's called user error where I come from. Um, thanks very much for the time. Um, so yeah, at, at ZoomCare, uh, I think a lot of people in the Portland area and the Seattle area where we have uh, 53 clinics and growing as well as a tele telemedicine platform, think of us as an urgent care chain. Mm -hmm. um, but over the co course of the last couple of years, we've branched out. We now have uh, 11 specialties in addition to urgent care, including primary care, mental health care, women's health care, uh, dermatology, orthopedics. Um, and within each of those um, specialties, as well as primary care, obviously chronic disease plays a big role in um, the experience that patients have every day. And at Zoom Care, um, you know, we believe that we have perfected something we call the patient, uh, the perfect visit. Um, it's basically on-demand healthcare. And I think those of you who had, have uh, visited a Zoom Care know the convenience and efficiency aspects of this that you can book same day online, walk in even 15 minutes later, wait in the waiting room less than three minutes, have a 15 minute visit and get out of there uh, with your problem solved. Um, and so we believe that that perfect visit concept applied to chronic disease uh, is going to make sure that people don't avoid necessary um, visits with their clinician. Um, and a lot of data shows that if you avoid chronic disease visits with your physician, that it leads to downstream acute, uh, acute care costs and utilization. Um, so we think we can keep people out of the hospital by having highly convenient and efficient uh, chronic disease management. Okay, thank you. All right, participants, you should view this panel as your access to an extraordinary group of experts. Do you feel free to unmute yourself, ask questions. You're all in the middle of developing your problem pitches. These are all expert storytellers who might be able to help you position your, your ideas. Daniel? So I'll start. Um, we're having discussions in our development. We're trying to make a mental health triage app, and we're unsure if our user is more of a broad-based, freely available wellness app that we don't really have a clear revenue stream or a more focused but limited app that would provide triage services either in larger clinics where mental health providers weren't available or in smaller clinics where they just don't have someone on staff. So between those two, which one is a better model to work from? Daniel, what was the, the, the first one was kind of a fully integrated triage plus treatment? Yeah, or so more like a wellness platform, maybe provide teletherapy, be able to connect them to a suicide hotline or a more serious mental health care provider, but then also have lower levels here, try some vitamins and drinking enough water. I mean, I can I, I can chime in on that. Um, prior to Zoom Care, I worked at Omada Health and Berta Health, uh, some of which uh, you all may have heard of. They play in the diabetes digital therapeutic space, um, and I, you know I I can give the commercial perspective, and that is that 
triage or, or care, uh, care navigation. There's not nearly as much revenue uh, in that as there is in the actual, you know, treatment piece, whether that's through uh, wellness content, coaching, et cetera. So if you want it to be kind of a long-term viable um, business and practice, um, the first option is the better option, but it's uh, only about a thousand times more complicated uh, because, uh, you know, do, doing digitally enabled mental health um, uh, therapy, for lack of a better term, uh, you know, it's still in its infancy. It has not yet been shown conclusively to work across all platforms. Um, so it's it's a much bigger challenge to do the first. But I'm, I would be skeptical that there's a business model in a pure triage app. You may want to consider this is Omkar. Um, you may want to consider a couple of things. One is you may want to narrow down behavioral health is really broad, right? You may want to consider, especially, especially if you're going the therapeutic or treatment route, you may want to consider narrowing that down to something much more of a specific type of condition or a cluster of conditions within behavioral health. And the third angle is, uh, and I agree with Mike around a provider facing triage tool is going to have a limited market and I don't even know what the contract says that would look like. Um, going direct to consumer is interesting, but it could, there's a lot in that space and none of it's really validated. The other angle is go up to the health plans as your consumer, um, especially if it's something that's differentiated because, you know, they definitely could see the value in this and there are quite a few health plans that are interested in, you know, technologies. Because the core issue you're dealing with is there's lack of access across the country with behavioral health. And so if you can find a way to take the lower acuity behavioral health conditions and provide some treatment options or treatments, you know, supplements to existing treatment and, and make some out, outcomes and improvements you can demonstrate, that could be interesting. I would also think about your, um, not just your payers in the situation of public health, but your payers for an employee base. So you think about your um, employee, um, what's EPA? employee provider or that where you can send your employees for therapy or insights mental health i don't know if there's there's a lot of nice matthias if you could please unmute yourself yeah hi um so we are kind of building a digital care platform for a uh, stroke in the chronic phase so as a way to really manage all aspects of stroke care, like physical therapy, speech therapy, um, like sometimes psychological help from a psychologist, occupational therapy. And I was wondering, besides the kind of fee-for-service model, if you, if, if all of you have experience with other types of um, business models that um, favor more like, let's say, asynchronous care. Um, I know about the remote patient monitoring codes that can be prescribed by physicians if you're used like uh, like healthcare devices, medical devices. But besides that, have you, um, do, do you guys have a little bit of experience in that, in like other types of business models where you could use that? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, as the commercial guy, I can chime in on that. Um, so the answer is yes. I think that RPM codes are as good as it gets for asynchronous monitoring and, and you know, maybe a little bit of therapy in the current code set. Um, that being said, you know, your average insurance company is uh, getting a little bit better and more familiar with doing uh, contracts with um, provide or vendors and or providers, depending on what you want to call yourself. Um, outside the, the parameters of the claim system. So on an invoicing basis. Um, and, and the reason for that is uh, twofold. One is there's a lot more digital care solutions that are not a good fit for classic claims codes. Um, and the, the other reason is that um, plans are doing, uh, or insurers, sorry, are doing a lot more value-based contracts. Um, and adjudicating those value-based contracts can't be done completely within the claim system. Um, and so, so I think ensure, you know, there's a chance that um, the stuff that you're doing um, would uh, could get reimbursed by insurers outside of the current code set. Um, the one company that I'd encourage you to take a look at is an LA based company called Moving Analytics. Uh, if you haven't heard of them, they're doing uh, digitally enabled cardiac rehab. 
Um, so it's post acute care, I, I think perhaps a little bit like what you're doing. And uh, they they have some interesting pricing models that um, include milestone based payments as well as um, outcomes based payments. Yanina, you're on mute, it looks like, perhaps. Thank you. Priyanshu, if you could please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thanks, Mike. Uh, hi, so uh, my question is for Mike. Uh, I want to ask about uh, aging in place and uh, like uh, that age group is uh, suffering from uh, like high rates of uh, obesity and how, uh, you know, uh, like the, uh, how we can solve for that, like obesity uh, with people uh, who want to age in place? Um, <laughs> that's a pretty big question. Um, it, it, what I would say, and, and this will be biased based on my time in the cardiometabolic digital health space, is that reports that seniors are not technology enabled are greatly exaggerated. Um, and, you know, digital therapeutics, asynchronous messaging uh, in the context of a care plan that includes basically, um, you know, clinical psychology based behavioral therapy um, is a reality, I think, at this point for seniors. Um, and, you know, so at the end of the day, um, what I always like to say in the, in the obesity cardiometabolic space is that Diabetes and heart disease are diseases, uh, uh, they are decision-based diseases, and those decisions happen minute by minute. Um, they don't happen every three, six, nine months when you happen to see your clinician. Uh, and so it's helpful, uh, perhaps uh, essential to have clinical guidance, whether it's you know, asynchronous chat, real-time chat, just content, um, maybe some type of AI-driven um, um, advice based on your biometrics or even your food logging, having that in your pocket or on the table in front of you if you're aging in place as you make those decisions uh, is important for reducing obesity as opposed to just waiting for your uh, clinical appointments. Um, at Omada, we used to say willpower is overrated. Uh, and in this country, it's ironic. We think that addiction to alcohol, uh, it's, a, it's a good thing to treat that through uh, continuous behavioral therapy um, with, without end. Uh, but addiction to sugar, uh, we tell people, you are, you learn the lessons about what you should eat and how you should move and exercise, and shame on you if you don't remember them. So I think we need to, to move towards uh, a, more, a less stigmatized model around sugar addiction in this country. I would also add, if you're looking at this space, uh, a great reference might be uh, a group that's uh, housed here at OHSU uh, called Orchitech, and I see the uh, uh, Surge, uh, Bob Patel is listed in the, in the chat, just put up the website, but it's a center for aging and technology, and they're looking at a bunch of different tech solutions for the aging in place problem. I guess the, I guess the one thing that I, should, that I should chime in and say is, um, I'm just being a straight shooter. Uh, I would be very careful about doing a digital health play in the obesity space. Uh, and I think part of the reason for that is, you know, between 2010 roughly and uh, 20, let's say 16, 17 billions of VC dollars were pumped into the cardiometabolic digital health space. Uh, and I think most people believe that uh, Livongo plus Omada and maybe Verda um, they are the winners, and it's going to be incredibly hard to overcome uh, both the lead they have in terms of product development, but also they've locked up a lot of the distribution channels. Like they have relationships with a ton of the employers and a ton of the insurers. So uh, I'm not saying don't do it, but you got a big uphill battle on the uh, on the commercial side. All right. Oh, Ash. Ash Nolan. You could please unmute yourself. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is a question for everyone. I'm, I especially would like um, Christine Monkhouse's feedback. 
Uh, I'm part of the team that is developing the COVID mental health uh, triage app. And we would like to focus on the underserved populations. And um, I don't know if at this Inventathon we are allowed to do a B core. Um, do we have to be for profit at this Inventathon? So those are some of my questions. Uh, so no, you do not have to be for profit for this Inventathon. We haven't placed any limitations like that. But Christine, I'll let you address the rest of her questions. Sure, do you mind repeating the question? Sure, um, so we are working on developing a COVID mental health crisis uh, triage app, and we would like for it to be accessible for everyone, but especially for underserved populations. And so we are not sure um, how to, make a profit from that? Do you have suggestions about that or should we go B Core? What, what do you, any recommendations you have about that project? Sure, um, and I'll just share that I'm smiling because this was, this literally is something that I internally have to kind of struggle with um, because I want everyone to have access to the app that we're creating. Um, the problem is how do you offset the cost to, to actually have this app available? And so one of the things that I've uh, made the executive decision around is to have a portion of the app available um, freely with no cost associated with it. And then the another piece of it is to have it accessible um, through a monthly subscription. Um, and so going back and forth with that a lot of, of, of how to incentivize people to A, use the app to prove out that this is something that's needed um, and useful, especially for those uh, population types, um, uh, people who need the app, um, and then be um, be able to to generate revenue from it. And that's that's where we that's where we are right now. And that's a de decision that I've made. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Hi, if I can chime in to comment on um, on the question, what I've found working with um, startups in the um, in the safety net space, um, I've worked with several companies where we've introduced a product to develop a um, a use case and create some sort of leverage or um, create an opportunity in which you can get grant funding. It um, is it's a uh, stepping stone in order to help move the product forward, as well as it creates an opportunity for you to have customer experience and feedback in order to gain momentum. That would be a suggestion. Um, reaching out to some of the um, the safety net clinics as well as the um, health systems within your area, and partnering with them will help gain momentum as well as um, create some. Um, some um, some traction for you. Those are great ideas. Thank you so much. All right, I have a question for all of our panelists. What are some of the best practices when it comes to developing productive working relationships for the management of chronic care? Yanina, can you clarify what you mean by working relationships? Well, either working relationship with clinicians or working relationships with patients. So what are the best practices? What advice do you have for the participants for best practices for developing their product? Is that too broad of a question? I realize it's a very broad I mean, question. I mean, I can throw some thoughts out. I think there's a lot of different ways of thinking about the answer to this question. One is, I mean, um, chronic care management is is a large part of it is around behavior change and and maintaining uh, maintaining um, certain practices that are essential to caring for the chronic condition. 
that's the obvious part. The less obvious part is uh, changing behaviors amongst a large, diverse population is very difficult. So one of the use, one of the mistakes I've seen developers make is they kind of assume a persona that's somewhat, you know, not really representative of the overall population they're looking to serve. And so getting getting early feedback from various different types of users, specifically as it relates to motivators and and, and perhaps detractors from behavior change, is something to look at. And I would add, uh, making sure you're not just approaching the, the clinician at the top of the, the response chain, but all the touch points that patients have um, in their chronic disease management from asynchronous to synchronous touch points, making sure you're talking to the people that are actually answering the calls. And, and I'll throw one more thing in, and this is, this is true in the pediatric space, but it exists everywhere. So much of chronic care management involves uh, not only the patient, but somebody else in their life. Uh, for kids, it's the parent. But even for, for seniors, there's typically a spouse or, or caregiver, or adult, you know, child, son or daughter. That person's just as influential with regards to making sure the, the chronic condition is managed properly. And so incorporating them into whatever solution or, or plan is, is key. And I would uh, just jump in and say that uh, transparency um, is critical. So very early on, the first group of people that we invited to use the app to test it, to provide feedback, uh, we were very transparent about why it is that we needed this feedback. And that was really to inform the next uh, set of um, uh, features that we would add to the app, whether or not the app made sense to the users, what type of users they were, were they patients, were they caregivers, were they people um, such as uh, community health workers. Um, and so those feedback were critical, but we were very transparent with them. And after we gathered that feedback, the next step was, how does this make sense in the clinical world? Because yes, we're going direct to consumer, but our goal is to really be embedded in provider systems where we'll be able to make the most impact. Um, so having a very transparent conversation with providers that are embedded in that chronic care management um, space uh, was detrimental and so very uh, helpful because that conversation led to what is the next piece that we need to do to move data to to these providers that they can then uh, be able to treat patients effectively. Uh, the, the thing I would chime in and say on top of what Omkar said uh, around this is mostly about behavior change is I see a lot of entrepreneurs get into the digital health, digital therapeutics behavior change space and you know they appropriately are thinking about this in, in terms of the patient experience because you have to have a great patient experience to encourage behavior change and maintenance um, but the way they try and do that is they say well this is this is what i would want if i were that patient or this is what my friend who has diabetes says that he wants um, and i think there there are a lot of entrepreneurs that miss the boat on the fact that behavioral medicine is uh, and behavioral therapy both um, are uh, specialties with a long history, a lot of evidence, um, and a lot of horsepower that can be applied. But I see very, for example, I see very few entrepreneurs in this space become members of and leverage the Society for Behavioral Medicine. Um, so so e evidence-based um, uh, practices as well as societies that know how to do this need to be leveraged much more by entrepreneurs especially those that have no experience in healthcare. You're 100 percent right, uh, Mike. We're in the process of redesigning um, a business model for um, di for diabetes, chronic disease management. And one of the key focus areas of focus for us is behavioral therapy, introducing behavioral therapy as a shared discipline. Um, and I, I believe it was said earlier that it's, it's really difficult. Um, we don't look at the consumption of sugar um, the way we do, the way we look at other, um, other uh, issues around chronic disease management and behavioral therapy is essential, especially when you're considering targeting that group of chronic disease patients. Thank you. So we know that uh, COVID has interfered with regular doctor's visits, supply chain management, access to emergency services. 
Have you seen any innovative solutions that have tried to address these problems, particularly in chronic care? I mean, for chronic care, missing that doctor's appointment could be critical to their long-term survival. Oops, Shana, you're muted. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear you. Can you repeat the question, please? And now you're muted, Yanina. All right, we're just gonna have a technical failure. Sorry, COVID has interfered with regular doctor's visits, supply chain management, and access to emergency services, all of which are important in managing chronic care. Have you seen innovative solutions that have helped address these issues, or do you see particular holes that you think need to be addressed? Thank you. Uh, I have seen some really amazing solutions um, to address um, access, access of care. I think um, when with the initial impact of COVID, um, everybody ramped up their strategies to ensure um, access to care. And a lot of the um, approaches have been designed around asynchronous care, um, asynchronous care, where in which the technology communicates with the um, with the care management team to facilitate um, real time interaction with the patients, and this has been a, a huge milestone, especially for us here in um, in Houston and in Harris County, in which we have a large number of patients whom we believed had limited access to um, cell phones and and computers. However. The impact of COVID has tremendously um, opened our eyes to realize how many of our patients are actually communicating through these devices that we, you know, initially thought were, um, were, were not accessible. And so in working with several companies, um, there is one in particular that has an interactive pill box, which um, helps us with our hypertensive management patients um, in order to identify when they're taking their medications and we're able to correlate the adherence of medication management along with um, the outcomes of their of their um, of their blood pressure readings and so we're able to create some sort of accountability within that structure and this is a model that we're designing within Harris Health System in which we empower patients however we hold them accountable through telemonitoring. And I believe that COVID has really shed some light into how we can utilize technology in different ways in order to enhance patient accountability and enhance patient empowerment. Thanks. And I would just add that, that telehealth whether synchronous or asynchronous really lowers the barriers that many people face, especially if you've got chronic disease, just getting out of your house at a baseline can be difficult, let alone getting to a doctor's appointment on time. So if we can leverage these tools, we're gonna to improve access. I think, I think the point that I would make about the impact of COVID on chronic disease, um, I think the biggest chronic disease impact of COVID is on mental health. Uh, you know, you have three times the rate of depression and anxiety in this country now, as opposed to uh, eight months ago. Um, and I think this is not an innovation point, but it's highlighting the fact that we don't have enough people who can provide care in mental health. It's also highlighting the fact that the way we pay for mental health uh, is um, messed up, to use a, a soft term for it. You know, the, the fact that uh, the mental health benefit has always been separate from the medical benefit and oftentimes much uh, more poorly covered by employers and by insurers is really getting brought to light now. Um, and so I, I have a big hope that uh, the pandemic is going to bring mental health into the mainstream and lead to long term changes in uh, the volume of medical training uh, of um, mental health uh, clinician training and also reshape how payment is done. Christine Hammerton, can you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes. So I am on the team that um, is, we've decided what our product is going to be is an app 
it's kind of a yellow pages for complementary medicine. One of the biggest barriers to patients that want to seek alternative forms of medicine. I have no idea why we have feedback. Um, is they don't know where to turn. You know, and, and I'm a patient with chronic conditions. I've got a couple of them that when Western medicine didn't do it for me, I wanted to seek out alternative forms of other med medical disciplines that have been around for thousands of years, but I didn't know where to turn. So we've decided we need to give patients a one-stop shop, so to speak. Where can they go? Um, like it was previously said, we do have a structure where we'll, ha we're ha we'll have a, a free scription for patients, but this would, since this would almost be like a referral service for complementary medical providers, perhaps they would be the ones subscribing to this. What, given, given the target or given the, the fact that this is targeting something completely different than Western medicine, what's your advice? And that's panel wide. Can you elaborate a little bit more about um, the type of care and the physician specialty? The of, what what you mean by complementary medicine? Exactly. Yes, I'm talking um, things such as Ayurvedic medicine, acupuncture, chiropractic care, licensed medical massage, um, herbal medicines, or herbalists, anything not traditional American medicine, pretty much. These are disciplines that have been around for thousands of, for example, Ayurvedic medicine has been around for 6,000 years. And it has a lot to offer that we on the Western medicine side don't always look at, just as one example. But that's what I mean by complementary medicine. Did that, did that answer the question? Thank you. Christine, I'll ask the question that my job requires me to ask. Who's going to pay for it? Absolutely. Um, for that's where we're thinking the subscriptions would come in from the providers, the complementary medicine providers, as well as Western medicine providers. This would ultimately, like perfect world, this would be also a great resource for our Western medicine providers to go to to say, hey, what we're doing is not working. Why don't you try this discipline or this provider or what have you? That would be perfect world. But it, the revenue would come from the subscriptions from the providers. This We want this as a free resource, this resource to patients. So it doesn't matter your socioeconomic status. It doesn't matter underserved, overserved. Everybody needs to be able to have access. So it would be a marketing budget for them, is what you're thinking, for the provider. Come out Probably, of the market. Yeah. yeah. And it, it is your question uh, whether or not this is a good idea? That and <laughs> and um, just any advice. This is we're kind of really hitting grassroots stuff here. This is not something that's been done before, but as our research has shown, between now and 2027 the desire for complementary medicine is going to raise, rise exponentially by 20%. Yeah. So like I said, we're, this is very grassroots, very, very grassroots. I actually, uh, so the one thing I would say is, and you've probably already done this, but if you haven't, um, go take a look at and talk to the people at Health Grades. Uh, they're based out in Denver, and it, uh, I think at this point they're the biggest uh, traditional Western, or I shouldn't say traditional, Western medicine provider directory. Um, and so going and talking to them about their revenue model, and they've got multiple revenue streams, including uh, to some degree provider subscriptions like you're talking about. Um, but but they're they're quite a 
robust business that might provide a roadmap for you? You know, when you um, described your um, your aim, it really I, took me away from healthcare and almost um, mirror an Angie's List type of business model. Um, I would recommend looking at that business model. Um, I think that the uh, the target group that you're looking at is very innovative. Um, it's a good space to tap into, and I would use a completely non-traditional approach in a different industry, such as Angie's List and you know um, referral-based um, listings, where um, you know they receive a referral through your um, your app. And if they see that patient, they would pay you a small percentage of um, the fees that they charge for that visit. So let's just say maybe a 5% or 3% referral fee. And that's, that's really the, the home pro and the um, Angelus, you know, model. And sometimes we have to look outside of healthcare when you're becoming innovative at, at different, you know, models in order for you to generate revenue. Because if you use a traditional healthcare approach, there is really no, no revenue pathway that I see. You know, that, that big question is who's gonna pay for this? You know, exactly. um, it lingers. Uh, here yes. in Texas, the, um, we did create an app with the 1115 waiver program, and it is a provider-based app, which helps direct patients and, you know, anyone that's looking for a particular service. Um, and it's, you know, offered through our 311 service and through Region 3 for the 1115 waiver. Um, if you want to do your research around that, that was an app that was created to support that program. Um, and maybe those two suggestions would at least lead you in the right direction. Or give me the name of that app again. It's, it's an 1115 waiver program for Region 3. It's an app designed to navigate um individuals around care and it, it's, it offers various specialties okay. okay and this is a free app this app was paid for through the 1115 waiver program but at least maybe the model will help you okay <clears throat> thank you you're welcome you're welcome Daniel, it looks like you've raised a hand again. Do you have a, a follow-up question? Yes, always. So in, oh, let my video stabilize. So in building some kind of um, mental health system, we're specifically focused on COVID-related uh, mental health issues. And I was wondering about how much differentiation that provides us and if it's actually a valuable thing or if the more valuable thing is focusing more purely on the mental health side rather than the COVID-related mental health crisis, whatever you want to call that. I mean, a couple of thoughts there. One is from a long-term perspective. I mean, I, I think I think the underlying, what COVID has done is it's kind of put a big spotlight on all the issues that already existed in our in our population. So I think while they are, they're definitely related to the pandemic, I don't think they're unique to the pandemic to the point where once the pandemic lifts, these, these, these uh, health issues or mental health issues are gonna resolve themselves. So you probably wanna position your company and your business for the long haul. Um, and honestly, for me, every time I see something that's that's branded as COVID specific, I always think about, you know, how how detailed or how focused is it on that, and how long term will this solution be viable? And for mental, I mean, there's been a mental health crisis for decades in this country. It just was exacerbated by the the conditions associated with a pandemic and an economic recession all happening at the same time. Ash Nolan, did you have a follow-up question? 
No, thank you. You guys have been so, so helpful. I have a much clearer idea um, about where we're headed. All right, I have a question for Miles and Omkar. So we were talking about targeting different audiences with pediatrics in particular. You have parents and children, and especially looking at issues of compliance. How do you address those two different markets? You know, so that the parents want whatever it is and that the children are willing to do it. It's, I would think we'd be aiming at two different targets. And I would say even more than that, because a toddler versus an adolescent is a different market. Um, I and mean, the one advantage as far as tech uh, digital tools is they're much more tech savvy. And unfortunately, they're living their lives on technology now. So that barrier is a lot lower. Um, and I think Amkar could probably talk to this, but you know, the concept of gamification or creating some kind of reward system. Uh, that's what these phones are designed to do anyway, is, is hit your dopamine center. So uh, can we do that through a, a healthcare app as well? I think it's an important thing to think about. Um, Miles basically stole my line. So that, that's, that's I agree uh, completely. I think, I, I think the more we think about, I mean, I think, yeah, digital tools are designed for, for adults and for kids around uh, you know, gamification as well as incentives and rewards, and however we can incorporate that into into uh, these tools for digital health would be helpful. Now, the only thing to keep in mind is the attention span of a of a child is different than an attention span of an adult. Although these days, maybe not as much uh, delta there. Um, I, I think the other thing is the the motivator for a parent, of a, particularly if it's a, a a chronic condition that the parent, again, depending on the kid, likely knows more of the severity of non-compliance or the potential issues associated with non-compliance to the child. And so that's what you're dealing with. If you take a seven-year-old child who may not really understand how complicated their disease is and what what not taking, you know, their various self-care instructions seriously or consistently, there's a difference there, right? You'd assume, and it's not the case always, but a 40 or 50 year old's likely going to know what happens if they don't follow their, their doctor's instructions. A seven year old may not. So it's just something to keep in mind as you think about building these tools out for, for pediatric populations. Though I would have to say on, on some occasion that's reversed. There are some <laughs> children, especially, especially adolescents that have a lot more insight as to what their disease is doing to them than some parents, but that's a whole nother. That's true. Kind of worms. Yeah, I do think that the, so the ad, the adolescent space is a really interesting one for all technologists to think about, particularly those fourteen and up, uh, fourteen to twenty one even, which is not really adolescence, but still from a business standpoint, from a technology standpoint, um, because they're definitely technologically very savvy. Uh, they definitely have a lot more. Uh, they're they're a lot more in tune with what what they need to do. Um, but but they're motivated in a way because they've got their life ahead of them and they're you know, engaged in a way. So it's an interesting population to build solutions for, and it's often very under underserved. And I would also say from a privacy standpoint, much more complicated. Yeah, I would think about too, I, I'm one of those, I'm going to talk as a consumer for a second, though. I um, have a toddler, two teenagers, parents to take care of. I'm part of that sandwich um, population. And I keep hearing the word or the, you know, the term app. And I have to caution you all that even to tell my teenagers, hey, did you download the app? Like that's different for them than it is for something that integrates in their current apps that they use, right? So if they're in Snapchat or they're in um, the other, what's the word I'm looking for? What's Instagram and so on and so forth. And you can name them going forward or certain games that they already play. If there's any way to be able to I hate to say this because you just mentioned privacy, but monitor or look at those behaviors and the apps that they're in all the time or have an app that runs concurrently because I feel like having them go into a different app or to access something different is not necessarily as common with kids, parents, and everyone in between as it is to use what they're used to using. So again, it comes into more of a motion of or notion of passive behavior modification or monitoring or anything that you can that they don't have to actually do something different or add to their current lifestyle may be more effective. Thank you. Um, Shauna and Mike, you both touched on compliance issues and behavioral modification. 
What kind of innovations are you seeing in those areas? And by compliance, you mean patient compliance. So um, you talked about you made you talked about the comparison with uh, like alcoholic substance abuse groups and sugar. Um, Shauna, you mentioned a device that connected for blood pressure and medication taking and, and making sure that there was that kind of patient compliance. So I think one of the big issues with management of chronic diseases is people stopping taking their medication, stopping whatever the behavioral modification is, just generalized fatigue. It's a long-term process. It's not a quick solution. Yeah, I can chime in on that. I think um, I was just going to bring this up, so thank you. Um, I, I think the elephant in the room that we haven't talked about when it comes to digitally enabled chronic disease management, and it builds on something Omkar said earlier, which is, uh, I'll paraphrase, but uh, there's no one-size-fits-all solution. You have to personalize the intervention to the person's age, the person's uh, gender or sexual identity, their culture, you know, their their ethnic culture, all that. Um, and the elephant in the room is that it's pretty cost inefficient <clears throat> to do that uh, using only human labor. Um, and the fact that we've got you know data science driven personalization engines now on the consumer side, like you get served exactly what you need by Amazon and Facebook and all, all of them. Um, we're just at the beginning of using technology to do that in healthcare. And there's no more important place to do it in behavior modification because uh, you know, a clinical psychology program for one person, even though structurally it's the same, it's going to uh, the words are going to be completely different for another person. Um, and we have to be able to um, do that in a cost efficient way and a data driven way. Um, so I think that's a huge use of technology going forward. Oops. If, you, if you're a, if you're a data scientist and you want to work in healthcare, you can write your own ticket as far as I'm concerned for the next 30 years. It's it, it perhaps is the most important job in healthcare for the next decade or two or three. I completely agree. Um, data science is uh, is really directing us, especially just machine learning and AI, fully understanding um, patient needs, patterns, and another strong area that we often uh, forget to integrate is acculturation and fully understanding how our individuals interacting. Um, we tend to create a, a cookie cutter model that we believe will fit all communities, all dynamics, and you know everyone within the population. But if we start to look at acculturation and integrate that with behavior therapy, then we really start to gain momentum and we can individualize care. And we can use those scales and those frameworks into data science to help us understand patterns, especially um, you know, geo patterns, um, and it will help us to ensure that we're treating each community differently according to their needs. I, th I think the other the other thing I would say on this before we wrap is um, we're really good as as health services researchers, and I've, I've I'm trained in that um, as well. We're really good at measuring what people do, um, and we're not so good at measuring why they do it, uh, and and we're pretty bad at measuring whether or not they're going to do it later uh, or in the future. Um, and and so I think. Uh, you know, from a research point of view, investing in things like, um, you know, activation and motivation indices. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know what the sound is, um, but uh, that measure whether or not somebody is actually motivated to make change and maintain those changes. We need a lot better data um, and archetyping of patients uh, according to that data so that we can, you know, come to people where they are and come to them when they are motivated to actually make change and understand why they're drop, uh, falling off the wagon, if you will, uh, down, down the stream. All right, well, Great. I th think we're about out of time. So I wanna thank our panelists very much for, for all of their advice and, and their tips for the participants. And we wish everybody the best of luck as the Pitch Fest moves forward. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.